Uh, this yes, sir. Is, this is a famous picture of uh, 19, 1927 Salve Conference, where uh, the rules of quantum mechanics that uh, we are now using have been formulated. And probably people say that this is historically a very important picture because so many uh, best brains together have debated on the issue and then formulated the theory which is standing the test of time. I miss many of uh, doubts and discomforts the theory has, but it works very well on a, as a practical theory. So, so let us just look at this experiment. So this is a double slit experiment. I think some of you have done this experiment in your optics courses. So let's say you have, so the first experiment here is, uh, we are doing this experiment here with some kind of uh, larger objects. Uh, let's say we are talking about some bullets. So you have a gun here and this gun keeps shooting bullets. And these bullets, if they pass through slit A, uh, then either they will pass through slit A or they will pass through slit B. If they pass through slit A, then they will come here. And if they pass through slit B, they will come here. So you will see that uh, the bullets will actually have a kind of a distribution, which I can plot it, that it will have a peak here, and then it will have a peak. You will have two peaks corresponding to the population of these bullets on the screen. So this is something which is... Uh, Excuse me, sir. Yeah? So there is a slight disturbance in your voice. It's audible, but I'm putting here. Okay, so let me see if I can... Okay, how is it now? Is it better? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So in the next uh, in the next case, uh, let's take uh, waves, something like uh, water waves, for example. Okay, so if you consider this water waves, then let's say this is a wave train that is coming, and then when uh, it crosses this, secondary wave trains will start. So all the waves that we know of will have this secondary wave trains and these secondary wave trains when they meet each other there will be constructive and destructive interference that takes place and because of that you have this interference pattern so this is what we call as interference so interference is uh, a characteristic behavior of waves this is what we understand when we divided physics in terms of particle sector and wave sector. And if there are uh, phenomena involving wave sector, then there will be interference. And this was first, in fact, this was first uh, uh, described, I mean, discovered by Young's, uh, Young, Young's double slit experiment, this is called. And it is this experiment, uh, which actually, there was a, there was a debate whether light is made up of particles because Isaac Newton believed that uh, I, uh, this light is made up of particles which he called as carpuzzles and people like Huygens believed that it is wave and this Young's experiment has actually uh, in some sense clinched this debate in favor of uh, wave light being a wave than a particle so Young's double slit experiment is uh, kind of a very important experiment to establish the wave nature of light. So whether in optics lab, if you if you do this experiment, you will see an interference pattern. Okay. So same thing, you take water waves or sound waves, any waves you take, you have this kind of an interference pattern. Now let's look at uh, a third case. Now we are going to take 
some of the objects which have to be treated quantum mechanically. Okay, so let us, for example, say that we are talking about electrons. So you do the same experiment with electrons. Okay, so this experiment um, uh, has been done by people with the different different sources: electrons, photons, neutrons, even bigger objects like uh, uh, carbon sixty, carbon seventy molecules, uh, atoms. So so many different uh, sources have been taken here, and in each case, people have observed the following thing. So now you see that. Um, we may think that these electrons are like particles. That means they should be behave like bullets. But then, uh, even though here in the picture it is not uh, picture, the wave is not drawn, but the particle uh, may go through this slit or this slit. But then, ultimately, you will see there is a interference pattern. That means uh, bright lot of particles are coming in that corresponds to a bright. Uh, spot or a peak, and emptiness is like a zero, that means dark spot, and so on. So, you will see that uh, this corresponds to an interference pattern like this. Interference pattern like this. So, electrons, uh, when double slit experiment is done with electrons, we get interference. So, now the point is. Uh, so this tells us that we can, we, we may have to conclude that electron uh, is a wave, or electron behaves like a wave. So this same, there seems to be something called wave nature. Wave nature for electron. Okay, seems to be physically this is this is important to consider. Now, this experiment can be actually tried uh, slightly uh, in more detail. Let's say we assume that uh, the this electron gun, uh, which is releasing electrons one by one, uh, is releasing these electrons in such a way that the electron is uh, ejected from this gun. And this electron will pass through this double slit arrangement, and then it will go and uh, get itself registered on the screen. Now, in this process, there is no other electron because the second electron will be uh, will be coming out of this electron gun only after the first electron is registered on the screen. Now, it is possible to uh, arrange an experiment like this. Okay, so in that case, what happens? There is only one electron that is coming out, and at any given amount of, at any given point in time, there is only one electron in the entire apparatus. After that electron goes and gets itself registered on the screen at some location, then the second electron will come. So one can design experiments like this these days with the technological advancement, and if you do that. Then what happens is the first electron will go and then get itself registered somewhere on the screen. Then the second electron will come and it will also get registered on the screen somewhere. Now, if you look at the locations where these electrons are getting registered, you will see, uh, see this is like some kind of a, when electron is getting registered on the screen, you will see a click. Okay, so because that is some um, uh, fluorescent screen, so you will see a click. And uh, the click is always seen on the screen at a point. That means this electron, when it is getting registered on the screen, it is getting registered as um, as a point, uh, as a particle. Because if it is a wave, then it may be spread uh, in some region in the in in this space. So from from its registering on the screen, it looks like it is registering at a point. Okay. Now, what happens if you uh, do this experiment for a long time with large number of electrons, then you will realize that after you, so you would expect that, okay, if it is registered as a particle, maybe I will see some two kind of peaks like in the case of bullets, okay? So, so here we have an experiment. Uh, I'm just trying to show you a movie. Uh, 
so this is an experiment uh, done by hitachi group in japan uh, so this is a double slit experiment so what i'm going to show you is uh, i'm just only in this in this video you will only see the screen okay so how the electrons are coming and getting registered on the screen and the experimental arrangement is such that um, the electron which is uh, only one electron is there in the entire apparatus at one time that means only after the first electron gets registered on the screen second electron is released okay so just look at uh, uh, what is happening and how the electrons are getting registered on the screen okay i think there are some subtitles you can see there is of course some audio in this but i think you will not see the audio you will not hear the audio Okay. So, um, could you could you hear the voice? Yes, sir, slightly. Not not my voice, but uh, the voice in the video. Yeah, it's slightly, but it was not understandable. It was not understandable. But you could read the you could read the subtitles, right? Yes, sir. So the idea is that uh, even though when you are detecting each electron is detected, it appears like the electron is detected somewhere on the screen. But when you see large number of electrons, when you do this experiment with large number of electrons, clearly the interference fringes are showing up. So um, now I want I want you to reflect on. uh this experiment and and i want you to i want you to say if, what what is it that you uh make out of this or what questions come to your mind seeing this experiment i would be glad if uh some of you can say something about it. hello good morning sir Ah, uh, good morning, sir. Can we predict which particle? Uh, can we predict a particle will follow which uh, which path uh, from this light? You are asking, can we predict? Yes, sir. Hmm. Okay, I don't think we can predict uh, from this experiment. But uh, what what do you think an electron is behaving as here? Is behaving like a particle or a wave? Electron is behaving like a wave. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you say when it is detected on the screen? You are seeing a click. That means it yes, is sir. like a particle. Sir, it's behaving like a wave uh, when passed through the slits, mm. and behaving like a particle when hit the screen. Okay, so that means you are saying, see, uh, 
you are trying to build a mystery slightly more mysterious because earlier uh, i think in quantum mechanics you might have heard that people say that uh, an electron in some experiments it behaves like um, like a particle in some other experiments it behaves like a wave for example if you are uh, conducting a uh, davison germer uh, like experiment then the electron behaves like a wave or if you are conducting something like a cloud chamber like an experiment where electron actually leaves a track then electron behaves like a particle similarly for a photon if you have um, a photoelectric effect like experiment it behaves like a particle and young's double slit like experiment it behaves like a wave so normally the understanding is that uh, in a given experiment it will either behave like a particle or like a wave now what you are saying is in a given experiment itself in some part of the experiment it can behave like a wave and some other part of the experiment it can behave like a particle uh, excuse me sir yeah so this is samarth mishra sir uh, here what i think sir the electron is completely behaving like a wave and we yeah. are seeing peak and not peak because of the constructive interference and the destructive interference and uh, uh, not only electron all the particles behave like a wave up to mm. a certain limit and uh, when the size of the particle increases the the wave nature it will diminish and the particle nature become more uh, uh, you know effective okay so how are we how are you going to understand uh, the particle uh, particle getting registered as a click on the screen so it's because of the constructive interference of the uh, particle wave nature what is getting interfered with what sir because uh, when the like uh, they are many uh, uh, like after it uh, after when the electrons are coming out of the slit so mm -hmm. as a wave nature each electro, each point of the slit acts as a new source of the uh, like wave for the electron so the uh, this waves uh, get interference accordingly constructive and uh, uh, destructive yeah i understand uh, constructive and destructive interference if they are waves but in in the case of light or uh, water waves experiment if you see because of constructive and constructive and destructive interference that whole region of the bright fringe right so that entire region uh, will be bright always correct it's not that uh, only a point will be bright and other point will not be bright it's and there it is not that uh, this interference pattern is actually building up it is there right from the beginning if you have a wave right so your constructive and destructive interference will never be registered on the screen like a point by point and this number of points will uh, segregate themselves to get interference pressure that is not what we observe in the wave isn't it so yes, constructive sir. interference alone i don't know how this will we can understand this so that is my uh, difficulty sir one question arises huh. uh, is there any process going on underneath in the microscopic world all that somehow converting waves into particle ah okay so somehow is there some process which we don't understand or we don't uh, observe uh, that will convert the waves to particles and particles to waves yes sir okay so that is possible uh, because uh, since we didn't discover it you can always say there is a process but then you should also say that there is uh, how do i discover that process if there is a process then it should be discoverable okay so we can always say like that but then we should also tell uh, how to, how do i how do i make an observable predictions such that i can do an experiment and then observe if i am finding it okay there is a uh, there is a chance for such a thing to happen if i don't observe it then such a thing doesn't exist so we should always make such uh, predictions But whatever proposal that we give we should make such predictions hello sir excuse me sir okay sir yeah 
like we are getting that point to point uh, imprints maybe because of the kinetic energy the electrons will already will have kinetic energy so that nature will not be lost in the process so that's why we are and when the electron is hitting the screen then the impact of its kinetic energy will be visible right like we can't ignore the impact of kinetic energy uh, of electron which will be because of its uh, classical mechanical reason okay yeah but how is it interfering because if you have uh, kinetic energy then we don't understand this interference because kinetic energy should simply uh, allow this particle to have a particular trajectory and that tra trajectory may be it is passing through slit 1 or slit 2 it doesn't matter but uh, we don't understand how interference is taking place our interference fringes are occurring Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, is there any minimum number of electrons that can confirm this wave nature? I mean, uh, when we started the experiment with uh, five electrons or 15 electrons, it was hard to know that, I mean, uh, conclude that uh, electron is behaving like waves or anything. So yeah. it was particle only. So is there any minimum number of electrons that can uh, confirm the wave nature? No, uh, I try to understand it like this. It is difficult for us to infer the interference fringes are there if you take small number of electrons. But it is there. Uh, but see, for example, if you, uh, if you see with small number of electrons, they are also occurring at different different places on the screen but then that is forming an interference pattern is something which we would not we could not decipher with small number of electrons but i think the concept is still the same an electron which is coming out of this double slit arrangement is going to get registered on the screen only in those locations where uh, that bright spots, uh, bright uh, locations are there, but they are uh, they look random because that bright dark, uh, what is called the resolution, is not there with small number of electrons. Okay, so even with one electron, I think it uh, goes and sits in one of those bright locations only. as if that electron is guided. So, I, 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 in my understanding, there is, no, uh, there is no critical number of electrons that is needed. Every electron, even single electron, uh, will go and sit in one of those uh, bright spots. Sir, sir, sir actually, question. I have... Uh... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, I have another question. Uh, hmm. While we, uh, when we uh, take uh, light, uh, light uh, uh, in the exper uh, interference experiment, we take hmm. this slit width as uh, uh, comparable to the wavelength of light. Correct. So, how the slit width of uh, this uh, setup will be determined? I mean, yeah, if, uh, if we take. Uh, so what happens if slit width is very large compared to the wavelength of light in optics? No, sir. Uh, in this uh, case, I mean, in electron link, uh, in, no, I, when we take electron I, as... Uh, yeah, yeah I, under, I understand your question, but I'm asking another question, that since you uh, came with the analogy of optics, what will happen if slit width is much larger than the wavelength of light in optics? Do you observe interference? No, sir. Then there, there will be no uh, distribu redistribution of amplitude will not happen. That's why we won't see any uh, interference pattern. Yeah. So I uh, guess same thing is true here also. So here also your lattice, uh, uh, the slit width should be comparable to that of uh, uh, comparable to that of what, what kind of length that you can define for a particle here. Yeah, that is what I was asking, sir. I mean, yeah, the um, only wavelength 
the only wavelength that you can think of is uh, de broglie wavelength and that will relate it to uh, the kinetic energy or the momentum the particle has right so it depends on the de broglie wavelength of the particle it's not necessary that it should be equal but it can be of that order so if your slit width is much larger than that uh, typical de broglie wavelength of the particle then you may not find any interference ha uh, yes sir so the question the question is that uh, the wavelength or the wave nature of the particle so if suppose you are uh, talking about uh, uh, like how uh, de broglie wavelength or wherever the wave nature is important of that particle okay so only under those experimental conditions we can talk about the wave uh, wave nature or particle nature otherwise there is no uh, there is no there is no doubt for us right how whether it behaves like a particle or a wave so let us say that we have we have made our experimental conditions such that the slit width is small enough such that there is an interference if slit is slit width is large then there won't be any interference now that we are observing interference in this particular experiment we are only trying to ask a question as to what is the uh, what is the electron are behaving like in this experiment at various stages sir uh, but you yeah. i have another question yeah, yeah. go ahead go ahead sir uh, in this experiment if we put infinite number infinite number of slits hmm if let dig the part of the particle okay i understood only part of your i i listened only part of your question if you put infinite number of slits yes sir uh, in this experiment if we put infinite number of slits as it uh, similar to real world can we predict the part ah. of the particle no the prediction of the path of the particle is a different question and i have no way of predicting the path of the particle don't go to infinite number of slits even in this case i will not be able to predict the path of the particle okay so okay. prediction is something which we will not be able to do we will we will ask we will understand why we cannot do but answer is that we cannot Okay, excuse me sir yeah uh, excuse me sir sir yeah, yeah, i ahead. think uh, like uh, like uh, we were discussing why the, there is a particles when we are uh, like when why we are seeing point like uh, reflections uh, when mm -hmm. we the when the electron is transparent uh, so like mm -hmm. i can say that initially when the electron is having kinetic energy then it is showing its wave nature and due to that we are observing interference pattern but once it collided with the screen then it mm. uh, lost its lot lost its uh, kinetic energy and because of the loss in kinetic energy it uh, its wave nature is gone uh, so once the wave nature is gone again it's showing the particle nature so we can associate the wave nature with the uh, kinetic and mo uh, or momentum as the uh, degree did okay so <laughs> uh you should have wave nature if you so your your argument is you should have wave nature i mean in order to have wave nature it should have a momentum and once the momentum is transferred to the screen it doesn't have any momentum so it has to have a, show its particle nature did i paraphrase it correctly yes sir yes sir good argument that's a nice argument okay any any sir, others only two only two three people are sir, speaking uh, yeah is it like uh, yes. the probability of the particle in the brighter uh, sphere region is higher is it like that yes definitely see the intensity uh, intensity is proportional to probability in quantum mechanics wherever intensity is high the probability is high wherever number of particles are high the probability is high 
So what you measure in an experiment is intensity or number, and what you calculate in theory is the probability. So they are they are they are same actually. Sir, yeah. Uh, when a single electron is hitting the surface, we know its position. After we see it. Um, yeah. So if we know its position, then by uncertainty, we doesn't know its momentum, so it doesn't have a wave nature. Mm. But uh, when a beam of electrons come, we doesn't know the position of an uh, of these electrons, so we know the momentum. So if it has a momentum, then it has a wave nature. What I'm saying is that all these large number of electrons they are not coming at once they are coming only one by one so if you have one argument for one electron the same argument is true for all other electrons also because as i told you that we are doing this experiment with such a low intense source of electrons that one electron is coming and then after that electron passes through double slit gets registered on the screen only then the second electron is released okay in the experimental uh, uh, that screen that I have shown you in the Hitachi experiment, it also shows that it's only click, 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 click. Yes, simultaneously, several clicks are not happening anytime. Even though towards the end, it looks like this because the video was sped up. Uh, so it was fast. Uh, it was, the speed was increased to show it in a small time. But otherwise, uh, in the initial time, you could see that there's only one click at a time. Okay, so... Uh, so there is, there is, we cannot use a different logic for more electrons and one logic for one electron. As far as this experiment is concerned, I hope you are talking about this experiment. Okay, so let us. Uh, any, anybody else has to say? Sir, it may be due to uh, diffraction of electrons. So, diffraction or interference, um, both are wave phenomena, right? If it, is, uh, if it is, what is due to diffraction, you are saying? Uh, if a particle is uh, diffracted uh, on a single slit, it may also uh, show a wave pattern right sir correct correct so uh, because of uh, diffraction on two slits uh, it may happen to be a uh, bright and dark friends correct that is that is possible see normally when you do uh, diffraction uh, double slit experiment with optical uh, source Let's say you do it with laser, for example. Then you see uh, there will be a double slit diffraction pattern, and inside that double slit diffraction pattern, you will see double slit interference pattern. It is usually a little difficult even to uh, distinguish this interference pattern from the diffraction. Pattern. Diffraction will be dominant uh, uh, phenomena. But what I'm saying is that both interference and diffraction uh, are we have so if you are observing a diffraction, then we should conclude that electron is behaving like a wave. Correct? So there is no, if you want to just understand whether it is behaving like a wave or a particle, we don't have to really worry whether it is an interference or diffraction. We can say that there exists an interference and that is sufficient for us to say that it is behaving like a wave. Sir, uh, if inter interference has to happen, uh, it will be um, when masses of electron uh, is hitting at the same time only, sir. Mass of electron? Uh, when masses of electron crowded to a slit, uh, then we can uh, say with uh, we can assume it as wave uh, wave wave pattern, but. Uh, 
I don't know how single electron make a wave, wave pattern. Yeah. So the mass of the electron is anyway fixed, right? So you know the mass of the electron. It's not going to change one electron to other electron. That's not going to be different, right? So if at all you want to change the wavelength of the electron, you can only change the wavelength by changing the energy. Right? That is the kinetic energy of the electron. Okay, so that will change the momentum. The wavelength is basically h by p, the de Broglie relation between from momentum and the uh, wave, wavelength of the electron is h lambda equal to h by p. So you can increase the energy, that is, you can push the electron with higher in higher initial energy, then you can have lower wavelength or lower initial energy that will have higher wavelength. So that is something which you can vary. Uh, yeah, yes, brilliant. Is it like the electrons have equal probabilities to go through the switch? So, some kind of proposition of these probabilities. First. Sorry, your voice is not clear. Uh, the electrons have equal probabilities of going through the switch. So, it is like some kind of superposition of these probabilities that causes the electrons. Correct. So, so, the point is that. Uh, like what Brilia is saying that if you want to understand this, then you should say that uh, there is a probability that the electron will pass through one slit and there is a probability that you pass through second slit. And actually you should, uh, it's not the superposition of probabilities, but what we uh, define in quantum mechanics is superposition of probability amplitudes. And probability amplitude is what we call as uh, the wave function. Okay. So you have one wave function for going through slip one, other wave function for going through slip two. And if you take superposition of these two, then that will be the total wave function of single particle, one electron. So one electron has got a wave function, which is superposition of passing through slip one, passing through slip two. And then you say, I'm going to calculate the probability as modulus square of that uh, wave function. Then you will get uh, all the results that you are getting in the experiments can be uh, explained from theory. Okay. Now, this is the advantage of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics will tell you how to calculate things that can be experimentally observed. But after doing this calculation, okay, you still cannot say whether the electron is behaving like a wave or a particle. This is the discomfort of the theory. You can do calculation and you can show that your calculations are in great agreement with the experiment. And if you are satisfied, then the job is done. You are, uh, I mean, you know quantum mechanics. That's all quantum mechanics is required. You should know how to calculate things. And if you calculate and your calculations agree with the experiment, then the job is done. But then that doesn't mean we know whether the electron was a particle or a wave and when is when was it a particle or when was it a wave? These questions will not be answered by this uh, procedure of calculation. And what quantum mechanics, uh, what you are supposed to learn in a course like this in quantum mechanics is to learn that procedure to calculate, to learn that techniques of calculation. And if you implement those techniques, you will really calculate things that can be compared with the experiments. Okay, so that is what we call as the business of quantum mechanics. Okay, so exactly what Brilia pointed out is the business of quantum mechanics. You 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 can calculate things by using uh, that rule, and then you will get correct results. But the point is that we will also require to ask these questions. How we should understand what is happening. And without these questions, even though you will be a successful uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, expert, but uh, uh, I think it is important to ask these questions. Whether we are able to answer or not, that's secondary. But we should be able to ask and deliberate on this and come to a conclusion that, okay, we cannot answer it. That's a different thing. 
But I think we should asking these questions is far more interesting, and uh, deliberating on this or uh, discussing on this is more refreshing than just calculating and then finishing the job. So that is why I am spending a little bit of time to ask these questions or make you ask these questions, so that whether we get the answer or not is a separate question. It's a different question. We may end up not getting answer. That's okay. Yeah, OK, so I think uh, we have we have talked about a few things here. So wave nature of electron. So you, it seems that is if we just make a, a statement, then I think someone pointed out that uh, uh, electron behaves. I think Arup Jyoti said in the beginning uh, behaves like. A wave when passing through and passing through the slits and behaves. Like particle when it's registered on okay. so. This is, uh, in some sense, uh, we can say in science what we uh, what we do is we make something called a hypothesis. Okay, so suppose if we make a hypothesis like this, what will be our next job? Next job is to test this hypothesis. We have to test it. Now we have to ask a question, how do we test this hypothesis? Okay. Now let us try to understand that uh, we really do not know because we have uh, uh, no sensory access to this electron. We have never seen it because we are macroscopic, uh, macroscopic beings. Now, if somebody asks a question, uh, how does how does an electron how does an electron look like? Okay, if somebody is asking a question, how does an electron look like? We really don't know. Okay, and Actually, people who developed quantum mechanics have differed greatly in terms of answering this question. Because people like Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, this group of people who belong to this Bohr school, they felt that this is a meaningless question to ask. Because you cannot see it. Then what is the point in imagining that this electron looks like this? Electron looks like a cylinder, or it looks like a sphere, or it, it looks like a, a, like a star. So any imagination is meaningless because you cannot see it, and you have no way of seeing it ever. So this kind of a questions are rubbish. This is what uh, one school uh, had uh, had always said. Okay. Now people like Einstein, Schrodinger. Uh, and De Broglie, these kind of people always felt that uh, uh, 
uh, there should be some some shape some size some way of the electron even though we are not able to see but uh, there should there should be some some way it should look like no there is nothing like, you don't have to do, you, you don't know you you cannot see it doesn't mean that it doesn't have any shape it doesn't have any thing like that there is there is something the electron should look like something okay so it, if it is a wave nature then it should look like some wave or it should a particle then it should look like some particle so there should be some uh, some uh, some way it looks like and it is our responsibility to uh, devise a theory suppose if we say that okay it looks like star then you make a hypothesis that it looks like star and then uh, calculate and evaluate things and then show that if it looks like star and this you should be able to observe or if, if it looks like uh, some string then you should be able to observe this if it looks like some jellyfish then it sh you should be able to observe like this like that so people thought that we should ask this question and then we may not directly have an observational access but then we should be able to uh, make a hypothesis and then come back and then test our hypothesis okay so let us say that uh, uh, so the successful school as many people believe is that uh, uh, don't ask such questions is ultimately we can say is the successful school but let us still ask this question and then let's say that uh, i don't know uh, the answer for this but then i am trying to give some answer based on uh, several pictures that we have seen in the textbooks and uh, so we are carried uh, see our thinking is also a little bit modeled by or uh, influenced by what we see in the textbooks right so let's say that uh, the electron let's say that it looks like like this okay because i have seen this picture uh, in many textbooks okay so we will call i mean people call this as a wave packet okay so for example if you look at that science education magazine called resonance which is brought by indian academy of sciences this is the picture which will be there in the bottom of this resonance this is like uh, uh, what is called an emblem of that uh, magazine so this is uh, in some sense is our picture now let's say that uh, this wave packet has got this is not de broglie wavelength but this wave packet has got some length uh, let us say lw so this is the length of the wave packet now when electron is coming out of the uh, out of the source of the electrons it is coming like a wave packet like this okay now uh, i am just uh, making this argument with one uh, one dimension that is one length scale but actually you should have this length scale in other two dimensions also so in three dimensions if you if you say this will be some kind of a uh, some kind of a uh, a blob like thing it will be okay so in three dimension this may look like uh, so in three dimension may look somewhat like this okay so that uh, this particular volume so this particular volume will be something like uh, this lw the q okay, so this is in 3d so this is this is 1d and this is even though i have drawn it in 2d but let's assume that it is 3d so now now let's come back to 1d and then let's say that um, we have an experiment let's call this as experiment 1 experiment 1 where your experiment has got certain native length scales okay so let us call that as l experiment that is length scale of the experiment 
for example if you are doing an experiment with um, uh, let's say in optics if you are doing an experiment with the lens and what is uh, what are the length scales associated with the lens the radius of curvature focal length these are the length scales associated with the experiment if you are doing it with the lens so like that depending on what is the apparatus that you are using there is an experimental length scale associated with that. now let's say that in an experiment one this experimental length scale let's say is something like um, 100 times the wave packet length scale that means you have uh, so you have something like uh, this is your l experiment now in comparison with this l experiment you are going to have this is your l w okay now tell me in this experiment when your particle is here would you call this particle as a wave or a particle would you call this as a wave or a particle because it is getting registered in a localized fashion right compared to the length scale that you have this is like at a point so you will see that in this experiment one okay so electrons electron electron behaves electron behaves as a part okay in this experiment electron behaves as a particle now let's look at another experiment so let's look at our second experiment so in experiment 2 in experiment 2 let's have this l experiment to be uh, l w by 10 that means this l experiment is smaller than l w okay so this whole length is l w now if it is smaller than lw suppose if this is your uh, if this is your l experiment now how will this particle look like the particle will look like this correct in the whole thing this particle will have a shape like this maybe let me write better So what i'm trying to do is i'll say that this is l w by 10 so that means let me now draw uh, so your l experiment is going to be only this much l experiment so you will see the particle so in this experiment what happens in this experiment your electron behaves like a wave electron behaves like a wave so the dual nature is not because electron is choosing to behave this way or that way it is only there is some native uh, length scale for the wave packet of the electron and this length scale how it compares with the experimental length scale and that decides whether the electron behaves like a wave or a particle okay so if this is uh, so what i am trying to say is we have made a hypothesis first that electron initially behaved like a particle sorry a wave when passing through the slit 
and then when it is registered at the screen it behaves like a particle now it, how do i test this hypothesis so i am trying to say that we will further say that when this native length scale of the wave packet is in comparison to the experimental length scale how it compares that decides whether it is going to be a wave or a particle now uh, you can say that uh, if you have a double slit arrangement so when the electron is passing through this double slit so let's say that an electron with some length scale l uh, w is coming and now this distance and the slit spacing how that compares with lz determines whether it will behave like a wave or a particle next this lw is coming onto the screen now the length of the screen uh, <laughs> length of the screen so let us say this is your length of the screen now how this lw compares to compared to the length of the screen that determines whether it is going to behave like a particle or a wave now this is something now we can understand that if you have uh, if you have uh, so how do i test this testing is done uh, like this suppose as i told you already that uh, uh, large number of experiments young double slit experiments have been done with various um, uh, sources like electrons protons neutrons uh, atoms etc so now we take all those experiments from the literature and then find out from each experiment because those experiments they did not they were not interested in this hypothesis now if we are interested in this hypothesis we take out from the literature all those experiments and calculate in each case what is lw so let us call this as some d okay so we we say lw e and then ls screen length so we calculate uh, in each experiment uh, in each experiment so let's say experiment experiment 1 experiment 2 experiment 3 etc let's say we uh, collect uh, for the last uh, 50 60 years many experiments might have been done we collect this literature and then in each of this case we see whether wherever the interference is happening this lw should be same as d of the order of d and else lw should be much much smaller than this ls if that is if this data is consistent with our hypothesis okay so data is consistent is consistent The data is consistent then we can say that uh, the hypothesis hypothesis may be may be okay please understand this is the most important thing of science we have to say it is it may be we cannot say it is true we can never say that it is true we can say hypothesis may be true and if data is is consistent so let us say data is consistent then hypothesis is true so if it is not consistent then we can say hypothesis hypothesis is uh, false or wrong here we can say is but here you cannot say is okay so so if the hypothesis is false then we reject this hypothesis we reject this hypothesis if hypothesis is true then what do we do 
we do not do not reject we do not reject the hypothesis okay so what we do is either we reject or we do not reject now please understand this is very important to understand in science that we do not reject the hypothesis does not mean that we accept the hypothesis we don't accept the hypothesis we do not reject it that's all okay so this is very important difference and maybe tomorrow somebody else does an experiment okay which is not published so far and there we may have a situation which is not consistent with this hypothesis then at that time we have to reject it so every hypothesis is in science is uh, to be either rejected or not to be rejected nothing is accepted this is the nature of science this is the nature of doing science okay. so so in the, uh, through this through this uh, particular uh, example i have tried to illustrate what is the what is the way we do science and how a hypothesis testing is done so our question was uh, how does electron behave in this experiment so we have made a hypothesis that it behaves like a wave in first part of the experiment and then a particle then we want to test it then i said how do we go about testing for that we have to make a model and the model here is that the electron behaves like a wave packet and it has certain wave packet length scale now how this wave packet length scale compares with the experimental length scale determines whether the particle behaves like a wave or uh, a particle and to test this hypothesis we will collect the experimental evidences that are there in the literature in the published literature and then we compare in each experiment whether the data is consistent with the hypothesis if the data is consistent with the hypothesis then we come to a conclusion that the hypothesis is uh, hypothesis may be true we will never say please understand this again and again and again carefully we can never say hypothesis is true is is not possible hypothesis is may be true so if we come to this conclusion then we do not reject the hypothesis if the data is inconsistent then we can reject the hypothesis hypothesis is false okay then we reject the hypothesis then we have to make another hypothesis and the research continues okay so if hypothesis is cannot be rejected at this moment then we uh we live with that hypothesis but we will never accept it okay so i want to uh at this point uh talk about um, talk about this a uh, great man aristotle he is one of the uh, one of the initiators of many many subjects he lived in second century bc he is a student of plato and he actually developed uh, interesting methodology to study science and there is a very nice uh, <clears throat> quotation from aristotle which i always like is that the mark the mark of an educated mind the mark of an educated mind is to be able to be able to entertain entertain a thought
without accepting it. So I am fascinated by this uh, quotation by Aristotle. In fact, this quotation entirely captures the scientific method uh, we use in understanding nature. We do not accept anything. We always entertain something if we cannot reject it. But it doesn't mean that we accepted it. So accepting something in science is death. That's all. You are not going to make any progress. So you should never accept anything. You should always use it. You entertain it. Okay, but you constantly subject it to scrutiny, question it, debate on that. You can use it, of course. If quantum mechanics is available for you to use it, use it. But you should not say that, okay, this is the end. I will not ask any question. So you should not put it to that. that. So even though many quantum mechanics textbooks do not consider this kind of a discussion of what electron looks like and whether it is behaving like a particle or a wave, they consider these things are useless questions. Uh, but I believe that it is through the exercise of asking these questions that we make progress. And we actually see our job is not to become, uh, I mean, our aim is not to become uh, a kind of a calculate, calculational experts. We have to develop an all round personality in terms of asking questions, in terms of testing hypothesis in terms of learning to uh, learning to confront with some tough ideas tough questions and so on so in that larger context i am trying to present this methodology as a part of training in this kind of cases okay so this is uh, what is uh, about the wave particle duality and then the hypothesis testing that as a method as as a method of inquiry so this is basically a method of inquiry okay so let us uh, so any questions at this point Amar, I can't hear you. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, I was asking about like uh, whether it is wrong to associate wave particle with uh, momentum, as I mentioned. Like it will show the wave nature when uh, there is a moment of kinetic energy and will not show a wave nature when there is a uh, they, when there is no moment of kinetic energy or kinetic energy. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> see, we, we in quantum mechanics we actually don't uh, um, have a great distinction between particle having a momentum and momentum is basically wavelength. Rudy Brown by relation. Okay. And wavelength is basically the momentum from uh, the Compton's, uh, Compton's uh, experiment, right? Because the photon have, light has, uh, light quanta has got a momentum of h nu by c, which is h by lambda. So if you have a wavelength, then it can be called as a momentum of the particle. And if you have a momentum, you can call it as a, wave, a wavelength of the particle. So there is an interchangeable uh relations are there okay so that is why uh, people call this uh, uh, dual nature so uh, let me also i mean it reminds me something which i thought i'll introduce but i forgot so at this stage uh, let me introduce that uh, this particular thing which we do not call it as a particle or a wave okay so there is this um, there is this astrophysicist who actually tested this Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, experimentally. His name is Eddington. 
So Eddington, I think uh, he coined a very nice word. I like this word, but uh, it did not become very famous for reasons I do not know. So he called something called a wavicle. Okay, so this object, which we do not know is a particle or a wave, or it behaves like a particle in some case and wave like in some other cases. So he actually used this blended word called wavicle. Okay, I like this word. I also felt it was a nice word, but somehow it did not become very famous. I think you people would not have heard it because the textbook did not use this. So, so now a wavicle. So what quantum mechanically everything is a wavicle. So I am trying to use this word. Okay, so electron is a wavicle. Photon is also a wavicle. Okay, now what wavicle has? Wavicle has momentum. Wavicle has uh, wavelength. If you take electromagnetic wave, it has only wavelength. Okay, you can define momentum for that, of course. For energy density, momentum density can be defined. If you take an electron, it has got momentum. Okay, or you take a bullet, it has only a momentum. It doesn't have. So now a wavicle will have both. Or you can say that everything is a wavicle. Only thing is, uh, depending on the circumstances, a uh, wavicle will be more close to a particle. That means its wavelength is very, very small. Or it is more close to a wave because its wavelength is very, very large compared to what it encounters. So this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, word which Eddington introduced, I thought is very convenient to understand this. So that is... Uh, an additional point which I thought I'll mention, but I forgot. And the second uh, aspect, uh, what I'm trying, what I wanted to mention here, is that generally a wave packet, okay, so a wave packet is in general is a combination of lot of waves. So wave packet contains lot of waves, okay. So it is not one wave, two waves like that. That means this wave packet does not have, uh, because every wave will have got certain wavelength. Now, since this is a combination of so many waves, this particular wave packet, you cannot define a wavelength. So you have to define some length scale, of course. But uh, since it is a combination of several waves, we will not be able to define a particular wavelength. And we cannot define a particular momentum also for this. Okay, so you will understand more when we talk about uh, postulates of quantum mechanics. But uh, right now, at this point, let me say that a wave packet in general will have uh, so many waves, and hence we cannot talk about any particular wavelength, and we cannot also talk about any particular momentum. You can also you can uh, you can talk about an average momentum, and then some spread in momentum. So this is what we can we can talk about in the case of wave packet. Oh, any other question? Okay, so let us try to understand uh, a couple of more things. So let's say that. Um, so now let us look at this uh, this particular. Okay, maybe I come back to this. Uh, Back to this. So we talked about this uh, double slit experiment. So let me continue with that. Okay. One of the important feature of this double slit experiment is 
that like uh, uh, one of you have been asking this question always can we predict the path of the electron okay can we predict the path of the electron now we cannot predict it but we can ask a question can we determine the path of the electron okay so now electron is coming out of the source it is going through i don't know which slit but uh, since if you believe that it is an electron you can it is a particle you can say that it is going through only one of the slits okay if it is a wave then you have to assume that it is going through both of the slits now can we determine that so whether it is going through first slit or second slit can we determine that so that question is uh, something which is meaningful so uh, now if you do an experiment and then try to ask a question that uh, what happens where this electron is going through is it going through slit a or slit uh, slit 1 or slit 2 now by an a proper experimental arrangement let's say you can determine this okay. so uh, so this this is we are asking a question uh, which slit as electron electron pass okay so for that what i can do suppose a is the electron that is coming from the source then i can use some probe particle okay so this b is a probe particle so i can uh, send some probe particle and then uh, i can send the probe particle only along this uh, to the slit a so that if uh, the particle is coming through slit a then this probe particle will get scattered by colliding with the particle a and by observing the scattered particle i know that the particle has come through slit a if i did not observe any scattering for the particle then particle did not come from slit a it has gone to slit b like that i can uh, i can a proper experimental arrangement like this i can i can uh, <laughs> i can arrange such that i will determine which slit does the electron pass through okay now if i do that so i am sending electron 1 electron 2 electron 3 in each case i am able to say that electron is coming through uh, slit a electron is going through slit b electron slit 1 slit 2 like that i am able to now you do this experiment with this arrangement that is with a uh, electron path finding arrangement okay and then you allow the electrons to go a large number of electrons so let them go and then what what kind of uh, interference do you see? what kind of effect you see on the screen okay so when you when you do this okay so you will see that um, so that means you have so if you have this screen okay then you will see that there are only two people the interference is not there interference is not there so so what happens is that uh which path which path information which path information is uh which path information uh kind of destroys interference
this is the observation this is the observation but we should ask why why does it destroy why this question is very important okay it destroys the interference but why now if it is a particle if it is a wave okay if it is so everything is like same when I mean, we have interference before you put in this probe particle now the moment you put in the probe particle then the interference is destroyed this behaves exactly like bullets okay, how do we understand this it behaves exactly like a bullet the slit separation slit width everything is same according to our previous hypothesis testing if this electron that is coming in is like some wave packet and it should behave like a wave and interference uh, should not be destroyed maybe it, it can be a little bit modified if you wish so but it cannot be completely destroyed it should not behave like a particle okay so this is something which uh, is very interesting and very intriguing to understand so which path information destroys the interference this is the problem now this question why is very important okay and uh, this question why has been uh, of course you know uh, the answer uh, answer for this was provided by heisenberg we call this as heisenberg mechanics heisenberg mechanism now what is heisenberg mechanism uh if you understand a little bit about collisions so let us say when uh, a probe particle is interact is colliding this particle a it is scattering now in all scattering you know the direction in which the scattering takes place is uncontrollable it will be any direction in 360 degrees okay in 2 pi radians any direction it can come we will not be able to predict in which direction it will come okay so it, you may send this probe particle b along the same direction always but the scattered particle will be distributed in all possible directions okay now heisenberg imagined a situation let us say that i have a situation in which the scattering particle is always coming in the same direction which is far from reality but heisenberg uh imagine he is able to control the collision process in such a way that the probe particle will always have a prefixed direction in which it scatters okay how to do it that's a different question but heisenberg assumed that if such a thing happens then you will not have interference destroyed but interference will be modified for example let's say the solid line uh, in this figure is uh, what is so this dotted line is the line which if this b would not have collided with a this dotted line would have been the position so you can see this dotted interference spectrum would have been the spectrum which which is observed if b is not interacting with this now suppose if b is colliding with a now the trajectory trajectory of a or the path of a is slightly deflected but every time it is deflected in the same way because this collision process is controlled and hence instead of this dotted interference pattern you may have slightly displaced interference pattern that is given by this solid line so heisenberg assumed that if you are if you are able to control the collision process in such a way that the probe particle always scatters in a particular direction the interference pattern is not destroyed but it is only displaced or shifted in some sense then heisenberg 
said that okay if you understand this now suppose uh, let us try to get this scattering direction to be something else if it is something else then the pattern is shifted in some other direction now in a realistic scattering process since the direction of the scattered particle is randomly oriented in all possible directions there is going to be a random shift of this interference patterns in different directions when you combine this interference pattern it comes out to be no interference pattern so the loss of interference pattern is a consequence of superposition of interference patterns of different scattering mechanisms which are slightly displaced from each other when you superpose all of them you will have no interference so this is called heisenberg mechanism okay so this is called heisenberg mechanism so i don't know if i have communicated it correctly if you have some questions you can you can ask sir if the direction could not be controlled in scattering hmm. then why not the whole screen will be treated with uh, electrons why it showed only uh, the pattern similar to bullet like two or uh, two bright fringes only i mean they could they could have been uh, uniformly registered at all points on the uh, screen yeah okay so uh that is that is one possibility that is it could be uniform distribution or it should be it should be like bullets okay but anyway uh, there may be some experiments where you have that uniform distribution there may be some experiments where you will only see that two peaks okay but in any case the interference is lost okay so whether the screen is uniformly distributed or you have two uh, peaks that will depend on the initial condition but let us at this moment uh, not worry about that question but let's say that the main objective here uh, main observation here is that the loss of interference okay so uh, why i am uh, that question is important but why i am saying is let's not uh, uh, deviate from the main issue main issue is the interference is lost and heisenberg has given a mechanism for understanding this loss of interference is is do you understand that mechanism sir yeah is that low energy wave vehicle behaves as a wave as have certain momentum and at high energy due to interaction of uh, wave vehicle have certain position so behaving as a wave as a particle so you are still talking about previous uh, uh, question or no uh, no sir actually uh, due to interaction uh, the wave vehicle have a certain position so momentum is lost uh, so it has certain it in position so we can't determine momentum so it's so are, you a, are you referring to heisenberg mechanism or are you referring to previous problem sir heisenberg mechanism ah okay so what is the interaction that you are talking about here interaction between the probe particle and this particle yes sir okay so here the interaction is um, just the collision there is no interaction otherwise so what is that i want to know i want to only know the information whether this particle is coming through slit 1 or slit 2 so to determine that one i am sending a probe particle and the probe particle will get scattered from the uh, particle coming from the slit provided if it comes from that okay so i measure the scattered particle so if i see a scattering then i know that it has come through slit 1 if i don't see a scattering i know that it has gone through slit 2 so for, for every electron i can do this uh, i can do this experiment right so there is no other interaction i am at this moment assuming okay there may be some interactions you, you can always put in but at this moment i am simply saying the interaction is just collision so there is only an instantaneous collision uh, at which they interact uh, briefly 
and we don't have to worry about those interactions because we can say the collision times are very very small and hence we don't have to put in those interactions in any calculation at all yes sir okay so now uh, what what is your question in this context sir as uh, position is determined so it is behaving as a particle as it's lost uh, momentum no there is only exchange of momenta right so in any collision process uh, in two particle collisions at best momenta will be exchanged there is no loss of momentum completely correct yes sir only such a loss of momentum will be there only when this gets registered on the screen otherwise sir, at this sir. interaction that is this collision between probe and the actual particle there is there is no momentum loss for any of the particles yes, when you sir, detect it of course ah huh. yes after the measurement uh, momentum will loss after the measurement means after it goes uh, to the screen and gets de detected right yes sir yeah yeah that is fine that is fine but that is true also without probing no even without probe particle that was true yes so there is no uh, so here our uh, our question here is that uh, when you put in a probe particle to determine the which path information interference is lost what is the mechanism for the loss of such interference so that is the question and heisenberg's mechanism is to address that question yes sir, sir i have it yes sir here we are talking about one electron right so uh, one electron will be scattered only in one particular direction by one probe particle so are we again here considering the probability that it will be scattered in random directions See, uh, the final interference pattern is always a consequence of large number of electrons coming and registering on the screen, as we have seen that video. Right? A particular electron will always get scattered in one way, but which way we don't know. Right? So, in Heisenberg's argument, he is assuming that in the first case, all electrons are scattered in the same way. in which case the interference patterns will not be disappeared it will only be shifted is that clear yes sir okay but in reality it is not true that each uh, each electron will not be scattered in the same way each electron will be scattered in a different way now if you assume that these different ways okay you imagine that each different way is like a previous heisenberg's argument each different way is considered as one interference pattern then when it comes to scatters in different different ways you have to assume that the interference pattern will be kind of a superposition of all these interference patterns yes sir and just to that point uh, like i'm asking what if it is one electron will the interference be lost if you are probing but with one electron we will not be able to talk about an interference no because we don't see interference pattern building up we have to talk about interference only if it builds up so what is our what is our situation here without probe particle if you if you send large number of particles interference fringes appear now the moment you put in probe particle the interference is lost okay now this distinction is what we are trying to understand Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. The like this uh, interference pattern is lost because uh, like rem uh, I can say is it lost because of the randomization? Like uh, this interference is shifting into random directions. That's why we are not getting net interference pattern. Can I say that, sir? That's what Heisenberg's mechanism is telling okay. us. So, so what causes this uh, random direction shifting, sir? Why this has been shifted to any random direction? that is causing because of the random scattering due to probe particle if the probe particle always scattered the actual particle in the same direction there is going to be only a shift in the interference pattern because that scattering is random 
you have to consider the resulting interference pattern as a superposition of randomly displaced interference patterns. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if you understand this, then let's try to. So, there was some interesting um, experimental uh, justification for this. Okay, people got some experimental justification. Okay. So, what happened was, uh, I think in Anton Zeilinger's group, okay, so there is a, uh, a very good experimentalist called Anton Zeilinger. Okay. He is uh, even now doing some good experiments. Okay, so his group in uh, Vienna. Okay, so they did, I don't remember the exact year, maybe 98, 97, 98, something like that. They did an interesting experiment with, uh, so they have a double slit experiment. And here they have a source of uh, C60 molecules. C60 molecules. C60 is, uh, is called uh, Buckminstery fullerenes. Some 60 carbon atoms will be like a football. Okay, so it's are all called Bucky balls. So the C60 molecules are quite big actually. If you consider them as a sphere, and uh, the radius of the sphere is something like uh, 3.5 angstroms. So it's a quite big uh, ball. So now these particles are sent in, and then people looked at uh, interference pattern. Now, when they first did this experiment, then they did not get very good interference patterns. So they got some some pattern like this. Okay, so not a so bad pattern. Okay, then they tried to understand why the pattern is bad, and then they realized that uh, when they are sending the C60 molecules from, uh, from a source, the velocity of, it, it, was, it was basically a thermal source, okay? So, uh, velocity of the molecules, velocity of uh, molecules, molecules was, uh, molecules was uh, thermally distributed. That means whatever temperature they are doing this experiment, okay, it may be low temperature, but uh, thermally distributed. That means basically the C60 molecules have got a Maxwell distribution of velocities. So because each, each C60 molecule that is coming out will come in with a different velocity, okay. Then what they did, they they did a velocity selection, okay. So they improved the experiment, improved the experiment. So this is like a, like many of our many of us say, no. So I did not get a good result like that. They said then they tried to improve the experiment by uh, velocity selection. So velocity selection. That means you only select. You put some experimental arrangement such that only a particular velocity, a narrow velocity range of the particles will be uh, allowed and the others will be, uh, will be directed away. So if they do this velocity selection, then they got uh, much better interference pattern. They got an interference pattern like this. Okay. So, uh, so, it, so they got a good pattern. Now, what is uh, what is this uh, this experiment has got to do with our analysis? Is that just like uh, you don't have 
a proper scattering direction here if you don't have proper velocity here so this each velocity so here velocity is like a random uh, random variable okay it is randomly coming with different different velocities so if velocity is not controlled then you have uh, a bad interference pattern or in other words if you if you velocity select this uh, carbon 60 molecules then the interference pattern uh, is good so that means let's say now uh, if you so instead let's say that you, if you now argue that the result of the interaction of this probe particle is such that it will randomize the velocities one can say like that no as an argument okay so it will randomize the velocities that means this interference pattern which is very good pattern now because of the probe particle if the velocities are getting uh, randomized then this pattern will get destroyed and you will get the uh, bad pattern right so this is uh, this experiment which is a negative experiment has provided some uh, uh, so so this uh, so this provided provided uh, what we call as a prima facie prima facie evidence prima facie evidence for heisenberg mechanism though it is not a direct experiment uh, it's an indirect evidence that okay heisenberg mechanism may be correct okay so i think i don't know when this experiment was done exactly probably 1996 or 97 okay, so this experiment has provided an interesting prima facie evidence for this heisenberg mechanism heisenberg mechanism is old but uh, some experimental uh, evidence came in much much later that is because the experimental uh, experiments depend on the technological developments much of these experiments have to be done at very low temperatures so you should have cooling techniques have to be developed and all that had to wait for 70 80 years okay so this is our uh, uh, kind of an encouraging experiment which gave at least a reason to believe that maybe this heisenberg's mechanism is uh, is the right mechanism for the loss of interference okay so <clears throat> now we ask uh, so this experiment th there was an experiment that was that was done to directly test this okay whether this mechanism is correct or not okay so if we want to understand that experiment we have to learn a little bit more about uh, quantum mechanics so maybe we will try to develop that knowledge so i am trying to develop uh, this language of quantum mechanics not by using uh, mathematics even though mostly it is done uh, in textbooks by using uh, mathematics but i am trying to develop it first to some feel for the concepts then you can use mathematics mathematics is not difficult but first we should get a uh, feel for this so let me introduce uh, some experiment like this. so so i will i will talk about we talked so far about double slit experiment and we have some understanding some misunderstanding some questions some questions answered some hypothesis tested some questions unanswered and some questions um, difficult to answer some questions which uh, are good questions and some questions which are questions that are not supposed to be asked and so on so that is the summary of our discussion so far now let's talk about another experiment so this experiment is uh, so we will talk about uh, a source of uh, this is a source of uh, electromagnetic waves 
a classical source. So let's say this is a laser. Okay. Now the light is coming from this source. And let's say that this light is polarized. So the polarized polarized light is represented like okay. so this is polarized. And now let's say that uh, I will pass this light through some kind of a, a polarizer whose axis is uh, oriented in a direction which makes an angle theta to this polarization direction. This is some kind of a Nicol prism whose optic axis is oriented in uh, in direction. It is making an angle theta to the vertical. Now, classically, we know what happens. We know that in optics, we have studied this. We know that the direction of polarization after the light comes out of this is going to be in this direction. So the polarization direction changes, or the polarization direction is rotated by this. Now, what happens? Uh, you can also show from classical electromagnetic theory. If I is the intensity of the radiation, or, or the electromagnetic waves before it comes here, and at this time the intensity will come down. The intensity is given by I cos square. This is uh, called the famous malice, malice law. So intensity of the polarized light after crossing this polarization, if theta is the angle between the axis, this will be polarized in this direction, and the intensity is I cos square. Now let's say that um, after some uh, in some other location, I will put another polarizer with the same polarization direction okay the same polarization direction then what happens the polarization direction is same as that and then the entire intensity will come out there is no reduction in the intensity so here also we will have i cos square theta okay this is what is the situation if we have a classical um, electromagnetic wave or a light source like laser. Now let's try to do this experiment. Okay. Now let's try to repeat this experiment with source of photons, for example. Let's say I have a source of photon. We call this as a photon source. Photon source. So uh, and then so I have this photon source which are coming in this direction. I'm just representing them as this localized two things. Now let's say that uh, I will send this through a polarizer like this. That means each photon has got a polarization like this. Okay. Now we may say that uh, the photon is the intensity of this photon is small. So that there is sufficient gap between each photon coming here. Now, what happens when a given photon is passing through this analyzer? Okay, in this case, uh, we cannot say that uh, uh, a part of the photon is coming out. A photon uh, is not divisible. Okay, it is a single unit, uh, a particle, and it is not a part of the particle will not go go through, right? So what happens here, this is uh, a kind of a major difference in terms of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. So what happens here is that uh, one of the two things happen. Okay, what happens, uh, it, it is transmitted. Okay, that is one physical process in which case this photon comes out are absorbed absorbed or scattered away i do not know. even say scattered away okay that case that means the photon does not come out at all okay so
So these are the two processes that are possible for any given photon. That means it will either pass through or it may it will not pass through. So if it is not passing through, maybe physically it might have been absorbed in the material or it might have been scattered away into some other direction. Okay. Now if it is transmitted, okay, so it is transmitted and absorbed. Now what will happen? We do not know. Okay. So important thing is that uh, which of these two processes that is for a given photon so for a given photon we do not we do not know if it is going to be transmitted or not transmitted. We do not know that. The important thing is we do not know. We only know that one of these two things will happen. Either it will be transmitted or it will not be transmitted. One of them will go is going to happen. Okay, so when we'll know that it is transmitted, only after seeing it is transmitted, we will know that it is transmitted. Okay, so there is no prediction that is possible. No prediction is possible, and only you can say that it is. Uh, only these two possibilities are there. That's all. Either it is transmitted or it is absorbed or scattered away. Now, if it is transmitted. Then it is going to be in this state. If it is transmitted, the polarization is going to be in this state. Okay. But first photon is coming, maybe it is transmitted. Second photon, it is not transmitted. Third photon is not transmitted. Fourth photon is transmitted, like that. So you will say that for each photon, either it will be transmitted or it will not be transmitted. But once it is transmitted, its polarization direction is in this. Okay, so now what happens if you are sending some large number n, large n number of photons, the number of photons that are transmitted will be smaller than n because some are not transmitted, right? So you can see that if this if this angle is theta, if this angle is theta, the number of particles that are transmitted is given by n cos square theta. So this n cos square theta is like the intensity in the Mahler's law. So the total number of photons is like intensity. So the number will be reduced to n cos square theta. Now suppose imagine you are you are putting another uh, another uh, uh, analyzer or the same polarizer. Then what happens? There is only one result. It will be transmitted. It will be transmitted. There is no doubt. It will not be scattered away. It will not be absorbed. It will be. It will be transmitted. Every photon will be transmitted. So this is what happens in quantum mechanics. Uh, that is a classical experiment like this. Uh, if you try to perform at a quantum mechanical level, this is what happens. At a single particle level, we will not know whether it goes through or not does not go through but when you take n a large number of particles then cos square theta times n will be transmitted and sin square theta times n will be not transmitted that means they are either absorbed or scattered away so this is the description in terms of this now once it is transmitted its polarization direction is same as the direction of the axis and if the axis is along the same direction, just like in classical case, we don't have any change in intensity. In this case, we don't have any change in polarization. So what happens is there is uh, there is no uncertainty here. It will be completely transmitted. So that can be even predicted, provided it has already uh, its polarization direction is come in this in this way. So this is one experiment.
uh, that means the polarization direction once it has uh, come to this direction then after that it will only uh, fully transmit okay, so this is uh, so the important point is we wanted to understand that if a uh, photon has two processes we can only say that there are two processes we don't know which process will happen but one of them will happen that much we can say and you can talk about uh, because n cos square theta of them is coming then you can say that uh, at the same probability of transmission probability of transmission is equal to cos square theta and probability of absorption or scattering is equal to sin square theta so this is what we can say from this experiment so every single quantum particle in this case i called it a photon you can talk about an electron whatever vehicle that you talk about it behaves probabilistically okay and when you take large number of photons the result of what happens to the large number of particles in quantum mechanics agrees with what classical mechanics or uh, classical theory tells you and this is what is called correspondence principle correspondence principle talks about the quantum mechanics agrees with classical mechanics in the large large number of particle limit or large m limit or in some sense large quantum number limit so this is uh, our uh, first experiment that we will talk about talk about and we will talk about a few more experiments uh, maybe we will <coughs> continue this in the next class so we will talk about a few more experiments and the other experiments will involve some other uh, uh some other optical elements we can talk about optical elements to start with but such elements can be also devised with other uh, other sources okay so we will try to only we will discuss uh, these experiments in less experimental detail but more conceptual detail because i am not assuming that we are going to do these experiments in the lab if we are going to do the experiments in the lab then we we'll have to be very careful in trying to see how each one of these elements has to be put in proper place at this moment i am not going to discuss in that great experimental detail uh, but uh, we will try to discuss at least to extract the important concepts from the experiment so i will stop here and if you have any uh, questions or comments uh, any suggestions you can okay.